good morning and welcome to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. For those on my left at the table who are sitting in the back end, I have to sit up here because I'm the moderator and there's one, two, three, four, five, six chairs between me and the next person. If anyone would want to come up and sit forward, number one, to keep me company, but number two, so our speakers can in fact see the people they're talking to easier, I would appreciate it, thank you. Um, good afternoon, this is the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. Um, we are preparing for the voting coming up May 21st, this next three weeks, we have nothing, well no, for the month, we have nothing but um, elections and then we have a forum on sex trafficking, but I forget what date that is. The 29th, so over the next three, four, the next four meetings will be all on candidates and uh, the serial levy for the school, for Beaverton School District um, through this month. We are, the Washington County Public Affairs Forum is a neutral group. Uh, we meet for the education and exchange of ideas. It is open to the public, but only four members may ask questions. And we meet here at the Old Spaghetti Factory up on Tannersborn Drive, um, Mondays. Today we have two groups of candidates. The first group is from um, our candidates who are all three running unopposed uh, for positions on the Tualatin Valley Water District Board. Uh, they will each come up and have um, up to five minutes. And when they're finished speaking, then we will have Q&A on Tualatin Valley Water District issues to specific candidates or to all three. Following them will be um, Beaverton School District candidates for zone seven only since that is a three-way race for one seat. So we will start with Tualatin Valley Water District positions. We have Marilyn McWilliams, Dick Schmidt, and Jim Duggan. And Marilyn McWilliams is going to start the process today. Please welcome Ms. Williams. <laughs> thank you very much. Good afternoon and thank you for inviting me to speak at this forum. My name is Marilyn McWilliams and I'm running for Tualatin Valley Water District Board Position 1. I'm the incumbent and am unopposed and I'm very grateful for the confidence that the voters have put in me these past four years. I am retired and enjoy having the time to give back to my community. I've lived in the district for 44 years, enjoying great water quality and efficient service. I want to give back to the community and do my best to provide leadership and careful attention to the issues before the district. My qualifications for this position are my experiences teaching science in Beaverton schools and doing analytical work on water in both clinical and environmental labs. I served for three years in an elected position as a local school committee member for Sunset High School. And in the past four years, I've been an active part of the board and served on the Willamette River Water Coalition, on the Metro Policy Advisory Committee, on the Joint Water Commission, and as an alternate for the regional water providers. I belong to two professional organizations and attend their training conferences. Three challenges that the district faces are the choice of our future water source, which the board will make on April the 24th. We thank everybody who has given uh, us their opinions and responded to all of our, our um, reaching out to the community. We really appreciate knowing your thoughts too. Our second Second choice is choosing our new CEO because our, our, our CEO, Greg DiLoretto, will be retiring in June. And in addressing the needs of the district for replacement of water mains in older neighborhoods and making sure our reservoirs and our, our, all of our assets are safe in case of, of a subduction zone earthquake. I brought some literature about the water source decision and it's in the table back there in the beverage area. It has a nice map of the different water sources that we're looking at. Thank you for your attention and I ask that you support Marilyn McWilliams as I continue working together for water. Thank you.
Mr. Duggan, would you like to come up, sir? Jim Duggan is currently sitting on Tualatin Hills, a Tualatin Valley Water District also, and will give us his presentation. Thank you, Kathy. I'm Jim Duggan. I've been a lifelong resident of the Water District, have um, consumed the water since I was a very young child. Uh, I am uh, grateful that the uh, water district added fluoride because I didn't have a cavity until I was 40 years old. Uh, but I, like Marilyn, have been very grateful for the confidence that the voters have placed in me. Uh, I originally um, got elected to the board when the Wolf Creek Highway Water District and the Metzger Water District merged and they had an open election. It was uh, the best uh, five candidates who got the most votes uh, became commissioners. Well, there were seven in the field, and uh, I was voted in, in the top five. I don't remember exactly where I placed. But since then, um, nearly 20 years, I've had the privilege of being on the Tuolumne Valley Water District Board. And we've come a long ways in that 20 years. And I can't claim that it was due to any brilliance on my part. We've had an exceptional staff. For years. Um, we have made very good decisions in those 20 years, but they built on decisions that were made prior to that. And I think Washington County can be very fortunate that we have a well-run water district that serves over 200,000 residents. Uh, all we have to do is look to the other side of Portland over in Clackamas and see an example of a water district that has not served their customers well. We should be very, consider ourselves very blessed. Not only do we have a well-run water district, but we have two excellent sources of water. One is the Bull Run from the city of Portland, and the other is uh, from the Joint Water Commission in a partnership with the city of Hillsboro, Beaverton, Forest Grove, and, uh, and TEWD. Um, both water sources are excellent. We, we should be proud of them. And like Marilyn said, we're looking at the long road ahead for the next 50 years in trying to uh, establish where our additional sources will come from. And we'll be making that decision here in the next month, hopefully, if all goes well. Um, what I'd like to do in the next term is to continue to build on the water district successes uh, and also continue our emphasis on sustainability and looking at the long-term costs, not only uh, from uh, a perspective of what is most, uh, makes the most sense from a financial standpoint, but also what makes sense for the environment, what makes sense for our community. Essentially, it's the triple bottom line approach, where you're considering the real long-term effects of what the decisions are, not just the short-term financial costs. Um, with that, I, I want to thank you for uh, uh, listening to me. Um, I, I'm unopposed, as my fellow commissioners are, but we really do want to uh, engage with our citizens and make sure that we're representing the views of, of the citizens district-wide. Thank you. Last, certainly not least, we have... Um, Water Commissioner Dick Schmidt, who is coming up to the podium. And here he comes now. Thank you for bringing here today, and thank you for inviting us. Uh, my two uh, colleagues pretty much laid everything out. Uh, but what I need to say is that uh, the water district and their consumer, their consumer uh, surveys, uh, we are 93 to 95 percent approval rating. Uh, that says something. And the third leg of the water uh, supply, Henry Hague was a visionary. In the, in the mid-70s, he, he established Hague Lake, and that's been a reliable source ever since. And we have to look into the future, 50 years. We can't, 
we can't wait and, and do disaster crisis management. You know, we have to go out. And I would just like to say that I also am unopposed. And uh, our board consists of two civil engineers, a scientist slash educator. Um, I'm a chemist having 30 years in water and wastewater chemistry. And our fifth member is a political. And that gives the board a great balance uh, for making good decisions. And with that, I would appreciate your vote and thank you. Now is the time when forum members may ask questions of um, our speakers. And today we have the three Dick Schmidt, Marilyn McWilliams, and coming up is Jim Duggan. When you uh, address your question, please, please indicate whether you want a specific um, candidate, director, to speak, or whether you would like each of the, ca of the candidates to speak to your question. Thank you. Jim Gate, forum member for all the candidates. Um, just concerned about the emergent redevelopment at Jenkins and Murray, where the city put in new water lines right next to the water district water lines. And it doesn't matter if it was city funds or um, federal grants, a tax dollar is a tax dollar, and that project wasted over a million tax dollars. So why wasn't there greater oversight or public outcry on the city putting new water lines next to water district water lines? Thank you very much for your question, Jim. Uh, this is a cause for concern, and we had a number of discussions about it. Um, we have um, agreements with the city of Tigard and the city of Hillsboro in terms of our, our um, district lines and who serves which area, and we've never yet been successful in, in working out an agreement with Beaverton, something that I did after this issue came up, I did go and visit with Mayor Doyle and discuss it with him, and we pursued making an agreement, um, and it's still in the process. We're, we're trying to get that outlined. Um, I should say there's a bigger picture, too, that we're not the only spe special district in, in the state who's had this problem, that some of the cities want to annex areas and then take over our service areas. And um, Clackamas County is also having some of these problems, and it is going to be addressed in the legislature this year. So, thank you. Uh, Jim, thank you for your question. Unfortunately, um, I have to recognize which hat I'm wearing at any given moment. And in my employment, I um, work for the city of Beaverton as a senior engineer. And since I've been on the Water District Board, um, I've had to be very careful of knowing which hat I was wearing at any given time. During the day, um, I work for the city of Beaverton. When I'm at the water district, I represent the concerns of the water district. This was one project that was a conflict uh, between the desires of the two agencies. Um, since it was a policy matter, I'll leave that to the policy makers at the 12 Valley Water District, which I did not participate in any of the um, formal discussions of the water district on how to deal with that and I've made it my um, personal pledge to both the city of Beaverton my employer and the water district that my participation at either agency would only be to the good of that agency and never to the detriment of that agency the the water lines that you're talking about Jim are um, uh, something that the city of Beaverton felt it was in their best interest to pursue and that's all I can say. Thanks. Yeah, the boundary issue is, is the issue here. And without agreements with the city of Beaverton, uh, they can act as they choose in, in uh, these contested areas. Uh, I agree that uh, I think it was money ill spent, uh, but then we have no control over that. So thank you. I'm a former member. I was wondering if whoever wants to answer this, or I was wondering uh, long term, uh, we're warming up and we're getting less and less water. 
So I'm just kind of curious on terms of what the thinking is on the, on the boards and things uh, about uh, global warming and what we might do down the road. You said you talked about 50 years. You know, I haven't seen a lot of things about pushing people to conserve and maybe do things. I'm just curious. I've seen things. But I'm just curious as to what the thinking is on the boards about that. Because you guys are the experts in this. We are very concerned about that and are watching it closely. Uh, just as an example, we are putting in aquifer storage and recovery wells, which during the wet times of the year, we can pull water from our source, treat it, and inject it into wells. And then during the hot season, we can extract that water and put it into the system. This is one of the things. Number two, we have conserved 16% of our water since 2007. Is that right? Yeah, 2007. Uh, so conservation, people are, are coming aboard. Uh, we had our, our uh, toilet rebate thing for people to put in low flow toilets, uh, and it's an ongoing thing. We're not going to stop with the conservation effort. Thank you. This is a good question, Bill. One of the reasons we're looking again at water sources is that we want to have resilience. We want to be sure that no matter what happens with the weather, what happens with the rainfall and so on, that Beaverton is, or Tualatin Valley Water District provides ample water for its customers. Um, we want to have um, uh, more than one water source. We want to make sure there's several of them in case one of them fails. And our fourth water source, of course, is the ASRs that, that uh, Dick just talked about. It's kind of our insurance policy. The one that's in right now um, is a reservoir for 300 million gallons of water, and we're you know, working on additional ones to uh, make sure we have a good backup supply of water. But it is really important for us to find um, more water supplies and to develop them so that they're ready for the future, because uh, global warming is not going to stop within the next 30 years. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add real briefly that um, my fellow commissioners did hit some things that I'd like to really emphasize. One is that we have seen a great deal of conservation already. Our per capita uh, demand has dropped significantly over the years. Um, and the last time the district had to face a significant water shortage was back in 1991. In fact, that was one of the reasons that prompted me to become a commissioner is the water restrictions that uh, uh, the water district w was on at that time. Um, I, I think the thing that, that we need to realize here in the Pacific Northwest is that we're very blessed. All the latest climate models show that at worst we're going to have wetter winters and drier summers, but overall our precipitation amount won't change a whole lot. We'll just have more rainfall in the winter and we'll have to again deal with uh, the dry summers, which are ASR aquifer storage and recovery program will help help deal with. Um, but I think uh, we, we should feel very fortunate we live in the Pacific Northwest as opposed to other parts of the country that will really see a lot more significant, significant changes as a result of climate change. the question. I'd just love to have a chance to tell people about the sources we've considered. We're looking at four sources. The first is to um, increase the amount of water we take from the Portland Bull Run. Um, the good size, side of this decision is that there's lots of water up there, and there will be. You know, it's, it's a very, very secure source. The, the uh, drawback is that we would have to put in a second water line through 
you know, all the way from Powell Butte through southeast Portland under the Willamette River and then through southwest Portland all the way to the water district. And that would be very expensive. Um, the second source we're looking at is uh, the Columbia well fields, which are in Scapoose, just right off the Columbia River. And that source would be an ample source. The Columbia is a huge river and, and has lots of water. And the water you know, filters through the soil and um, forms a, an ample source of groundwater. The, um, the negative part of that one, though, is that the groundwater there has a lot of, of minerals in it. And it's, um, there's concern. It's you know, downstream from the Portland Harbor Superfund site. It's downstream from Hanford. So there's a lot of public concern about the safety of the water there. Plus, you'd have to pump it over the, the mountains to get it to, to our area, and that would be very expensive. One of our, our big values is sustainability, and part of sustainability is to avoid using a lot of electrical power to produce water. The third source would be the, um, the Tualatin Basin Water Supply Project using Hag Lake, and that we've been working since 2007, even before, with the Bureau of Reclamation to develop that site. And unfortunately, there is a, a seismic fault underneath the dam right now, and we're, we're, we've been making very slow progress working with Bureau of Reclamation to strengthen that dam and to, um, to provide for the ability for us to, to raise the level of that, that site to produce more water. Um, we are thinking now that, that um, it's probably not going to happen within the time frame that we're we're, we need the water, and we also need to think of our partners, the Clean Water Services, who needs to have access to that water to keep the fish in the river healthy. So uh, that water source right now is looking doubtful. The fourth source is to make use of that Willamette River resource. Uh, we do have the water rights there, and we are working with our partners in the, the Willamette River Water Coalition to uh, make use of that site. Uh, the, the Wilsonville has been using it for 10 years. They've had great success. They've had no violations of water quality and no safety violations in that plant. And it's, it's treasured by the industrial part, uh, businesses they have in Wilsonville. Uh, the Portland Water Bottling Company uses that water for all of our Coke products. Um, Sherwood just recently started using that water, too. So that's the fourth source. We would have to run a line from Wilsonville all the way through um, that eastern part of, of Washington County and then into um, the Beaverton and Tualatin Valley Water District area. So those are the four choices. And I've got the, like I said, I had the information out in the back there. Um, there's lots of different ways to approach the problem. And we've been working on this for well over a year. So thank you for the question. Harry. I just wanted to add to, to Marilyn's excellent answer to that is that um, the way things are today, no one agency can do things on its own as the city of Portland did uh, over 100 years ago or the city of Hillsboro did with uh, Henry Hag Lake 50, 60 years ago. So one of the, the main criteria that uh, the commissioners is, are going to be looking at when we do make this decision is, are we going to have viable partners? Um, because we just can't do it by ourselves. Are we going to have commitment from people? So um, uh, one, one of the things that we are looking at is whether we're going to have a, a partnership with City Hillsboro or some of the other water providers in uh, uh, securing a, a new source. I just wanted to add that not only did the Bureau of Reclamation find a geologic fault underneath the dam, there are two endangered species that will be, and here we go with that, right? Uh, a butterfly and a lupin flower. Uh, so that adds to the problems there. And the Columbia well field, we'd have to build a treatment plant over there to deal with that before we pumped it over. And then like uh, Mc, uh, Commissioner McWilliams said, the electricity it's going to take a lot of pumps to do it. And the city of Portland, what we're looking at is we want a third leg. If we put a dam raise on Hague Lake, we still only have two sources. If we buy more water from Portland, we still only have two sources. 
So that's an issue that we're looking at closely and carefully. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Pat. Um, this is one of those times when I'm really, really grateful that we do have our ASRs and that we do have ample reservoir space because we're storing a lot of water to be ready for any future um, water lack. Um, the reservoirs, we, we keep close tabs on, on how they're filling and um, Hag Lake is filling and uh, we're, we're satisfied with, with where we are there. Barney Reservoir has been doing very well. The snowfall up on the coast range has been a blessing this year. Um, I don't foresee us having any rate changes this summer at all. We could have a rate change next fall as we adopt our budget and, and look at the costs that we have ahead of us. Um, you know, we've talked about the water source decision, that's a big decision, but we also have a great deal of, of cost right now going into our assets, into the pipes and valves and reservoirs in our area to make sure they're safe in case of an, an earthquake. And uh, we're, we're actually re redoing a number of our reservoirs right now, which is very expensive. So we, we could look at a rate hike next year but um, over the summer, you know, I would not think that that would happen. And what was the other question? Um, I, I don't see any restrictions. I think we're in really good shape that way. Thank you. Uh, just as a sidebar, uh, you can get on the Joint Water Commission's website, of which I am a member, and there they have historical fill and use rates for Barney Reservoir in Hag Lake, and you can see it, and you can see the 1991 or three? 1991. 1991, where, I mean, the reservoir was down to nothing. But since then, it's filled as planned, and the usage has, has been uh, appropriate. Uh, one thing we also need to, to realize is that DX1 is going in. You know, and industry is starting to move into Washington County again, and they demand a lot of water. Uh, so that's also one of the things we're looking at as far as how to plan for future supplies. Uh, like I said before, we're very fortunate. Um, we had a pretty wet fall. So from uh, uh, the fill curves that, that Dick was describing, um, it doesn't appear that we're going to have any any great shortage this this summer, but um, who knows? We could get a situation where we have an extremely hot summer, a lot of people use a lot of water, and we could be in a situation where we'd ask people to do odd, even in watering, things of that nature. I don't think we'd have a major curtailment this year, for sure. To Walton Valley District candidates for positions, Marilyn McWilliams, Dick Schmidt, and Jim Duggan. Don't forget to vote if you live in that water district. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have candidates for Zone 7 in Beaverton School District 48. Um, the school district divides the district into seven zones, and you have to live in the zone you're going to run in, but you are elected at large. So what we know is that um, Dr. Uma Pierce, Linda Degman, and Tom Collette each live within zone seven, wherever the heck that is. Uh, 
Um, and, uh, but we have to vote on all the candidates for zones one, two, four, five, and seven. Zone three is the only one that is not um, up for um, contest this time. And six, sorry, yes, three and six. So that being said, I'm going to start in reverse order this time uh, with Dr. Pierce. We'll speak first. And um, all questions will be saved for the end as we did for the um, uh, TVWD candidates that spoke earlier. So Dr. Pierce. And I've been advised that this needs to be a lot lower. Is that better? Oh no, I think it broke it. Hello? Hello everyone, thank you so much for having the forum today. My name's Dr. Homa Pierce, and I'm a mom, I'm a business owner, and I've been a volunteer in our community for over a decade. Uh, I'm running for Beaverton School District. Uh, I'm running because, simply put, we need to put our children first again. Uh, uh, that, that means all of us, parents, teachers, local businesses, our entire community. We need, we need to provide, provide our children, children the future they deserve. I say this. I say this because those are the values that have shaped my own life. We need to focus on funding, getting that money from the legislature. We need to focus on passing our levy. We need to focus on reducing class sizes, bringing back the subjects that maybe some of us really loved when we were in school that are now gone for our children and our grandchildren. We need to prepare our kids for f their future, their future here in our Tech Valley. It's just the best place for someone to get a job, except that Intel and Nike and these larger companies are now importing their talent. We need our talent to be employed by our companies. So why am I running for Beaverton School Board? So, like I said, I've been involved in Beaverton Schools for about a decade through the Health Careers Program, speaking to children uh, about the opportunities in the health profession and letting the kids come through my clinic. And since the downturn in 2009, I've seen a real change in these children. As class sizes have grown and parents are working longer to support their families, it's had an impact. An impact on the questions the kids ask, their curiosity and their ability to participate fully in the program. And seeing that reminds me of the difference education made in my own life and opening me up to the possibility of being a translator in the Navy, uh, starting my own business, being a doctor. I wouldn't be here in front of you today I am not the best at math. Calculus, not my forte. Algebra, I got that. Calculus, if we had 60 kids in our class when I was taking calculus, I certainly would not be here as a doctor in front of you today. It's not fair to our kids. It's not fair to their future. So why am I qualified to run for the Beaverton School Board? First, as a parent, I care deeply about the education we are providing for all Beaverton children. I've been a volunteer for the schools for a decade, and I am active in our community, not always in the forefront, not always in the front, often in the shadows in the back. Uh, I've been active with programs like the Beaverton Citizens Academy, Children's Relief Nursery, the Northwest Health Foundation, the Friends of the Oregon Commission on Women. I've been a part of all of that over this past decade. I will also bring the experience of owning my own business which means I know how to manage a budget. Make sure your revenue actually matches your expenditures. Finally, I've served as a military officer. I know that's kind of hard to believe, uh, which prepared me to deal with anything that you'd like to throw at me. And that also has prepared me to work with all kinds of people uh, everywhere, from all over the world, in fact. My top priorities in office is we all know that if we can't get those class sizes down, keep teachers on the job, and offer a full range of subjects, we aren't going to turn around our Beaverton schools. 
but we can do more to engage our community and local businesses in seeing the importance of our schools to preparing the next generation. And I want to bring all of us together to put our children first. Thank you, Dr. Homa Pierce. Thank you, Homa. Next is Linda Degman, who is the current incumbent for the seat. Thank you, Linda. Good afternoon, and thank you for having us here today to, to speak with all of you. And, and I'm always inspired. It's the second time I've heard the directors from the Water Bureau speak. Um, and thank you for your work because I just turn on my water and expect it to be good. So, you know, we appreciate that. And I grew up in Hillsborough and we used to have to have fluoride treatments. So thank you for that as well. Um, so I grew up in Hillsborough. I'm a country girl. Um, and I know we put in our bio, but just to give you a little background on me, um, we, my husband and I have a blended family of seven children. Five have graduated from the Beaverton School District. I have a son who's a sophomore at Sunset High School and a five-year-old that will be starting at Barnes Elementary here in the fall. Um, two of them went through the two-way immersion program through the Beaverton School District and are fluent in Spanish. My one daughter is over studying abroad right now in Spain. Um, and intensively making sure that she's mastered that skill. And my five-year-old is signed up for the two-way immersion program at Barnes starting in the fall, so she's excited about that. I'm a first-generation college graduate. I put myself through school um, while working and raising a family. I have a master's in public administration. And I've been a volunteer in the Beaverton School District for 18 years, um, all through when all my kids were going through all the schools. I think that's really important to give back to our schools and to be involved. Um, done things like helping the classroom, field trips, trips um, junior achievement, which is economics and finance at the middle school, school, school level, um, teacher appreciation, I was on the whole school committee for a middle school for several years, years. Um, I've been involved in the business and the PTOs. I currently work at the community college where I manage the $450 million dollar uh, capital construction program for the college, so I do a little bit about finance and budgets. So my work in CCC, I've actually acted in higher education. It's not just about building facilities, but it's about building facilities that meet the needs of our students and the education that's being provided in the classroom. And without, as part of that, it's getting to know what that means as far as education in the classroom. What's the connection between higher ed and K through 12, and how can we better um, meet those needs? Um, and part of that is the whole partnering. You know, what, what can we do more to partner to get our kids to where they need to be? Um, why I'm running for running again for the Beaverton School District um, School Board opportunity um, opportunity for all of our kids. I want to make sure that our students receive the students now receive the same level of education that my older kids did when they went through the Beaverton School District. Um, I thought they got a quality, um, high level education, and I want to make sure that that continues. I'm truly invested in this community and schools. Um, in the school district. Um, I have many more years to go with a five-year-old just starting out, so. Um, I'm not doing this because I have any other ambitions. I do this because education is my passion, um, and I wanna make sure that we are educating our children well for the future. Um, we have a lot of our, the other part of that is we have a lot of our children in the community that can't speak for themselves or they have parents that don't have voices or feel that they don't have voices because of life circumstances. So I wanna make sure that we are not um, dismissing those those voices and making sure that we are representing those and making sure that we're making decisions for all 39,000 of our students in our district and not just the few that have the loud voices as they go through. Um, issues, I'm sure that all of us today and all the, the folks you're going to see next week are going to talk about funding and class sizes. That's the issue of the day. Um, and it's it's we've all seen and I've heard firsthand how that's devastated our schools this academic year. Um, and uh, as Dr. Pierce said, you know, getting in with our legislatures and, and having those conversations about revenue and stable funding for our schools is important. Passing the levy is hugely important so that we're not cutting more out of our classrooms and taking more away from our kids. Um, student equity, um, making sure that our most vul vulnerable students get the help and guidance they need to graduate and to graduate on time within the four years, not within the five years. Um, graduation rates. We can do better than 77%, and we should be doing better. We should be a leader in education. 
Um, college and career ready, dual credit, vocation options. Um, there's a lot, lot to it. Um, open communication with our community and with our parents and partners in the district. Giving back to our communities is important. I know I can make a difference and investing in our children's future is what I want to do on the school board and something that I see as non-negotiable. Thank you. And last, and already walking up, boy, good job, Tom, is Tom Collette, also running for Zone 7, uh, Beaverton School District. Board of Directors. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you, everyone, for having me here today at the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. My name is Tom Collette. I'm running for school board in the Beaverton School District for Zone 7. I am a co-founder of the Beaverton Friends of Music, a district-wide advocacy group formed to protect and grow whole child education in the Beaverton School District. As, As the board, board outreach coordinator of this group, group I have been working hard attending school board meetings for the past year, year, researching the budget, and meeting one-on-one -on -one with budget committee and school board members. I've been organizing parents and teachers, listening to their concerns and ideas, and sharing research about how the arts boost academic achievement, increase graduation rates, and are a proven way to bridge the uh, achievement gap. This past winter, I led a district-wide outreach effort that encompassed all of the neighborhood and option schools in Beaverton. Parents and teachers were educated about the budget and the importance of their input in shaping budget priorities. I'm also a classroom volunteer at Fir Grove and Cooper Mountain Elementary. My fiance is a teacher in the Beaverton schools. When I finish my graduate degree this summer, I will be teaching writing and literature at a college level. I received an excellent public school education, one which has not only helped me prepare for employment, but also helped me to become a happy, healthy, and inquisitive adult. I'm running for school board because I want to ensure that future students will be able to receive an education of the same high quality. I worry about an economy that demands more of our students and a school system that is giving them less. I'm troubled by the budget cuts plaguing our schools and want to be a part of creating a system that will ensure our students receive an excellent education. Last year, facing a severe budget shortfall, the Beaverton School Board passed a budget that eliminated 150 positions, including all librarians, drastically cut music and PE programs, and reduced athletic opportunities. This decision resulted in students facing class sizes of 40, 50, and sometimes 60 students. Teachers being transferred to subject areas they were not highly qualified to teach. Counselors teaching life skills classes instead of providing responsive services to at-risk students. And non-teachers managing media and technology classes. A time block representing 135 minutes a week or 11 school days a year of degraded or lost instructional time. In human terms, this has meant struggling students have fallen further behind, lost in enormous class sizes that prevent them from receiving individual attention. It has meant teachers pushing themselves to provide students with the same high quality education as previous years were feeling as exhausted in November as they normally would be in June. In order for our schools to recover from these cuts, our school board needs to provide strong oversight and be fiscally responsible. We must ensure resources are focused in the classroom where they have the greatest effect on student achievement. We need to connect with other school boards who face our same difficult problems. The board must also be politically active, working with legislators not just for increases to the current K-12 budget, but for long-term solutions that bring stable and adequate funding. This will also require a community that trusts and supports their school district. This, this kind of support, support is filled when board members talk personally, personally with their constituents, when the board, board listens to and acts on input from the community, when budget documents are transparent, and, and when the board provides the community with opportunities, opportunities for its voice to be heard by the lawmakers. As a board member, I will not only work collaboratively with other members of the board and administration, I will act on and listen to the concerns of my community. Having listened to many voices throughout my work as an advocate, 
I can tell you our community is tired of seeing class sizes rise. They are tired of seeing crucial subjects like PE, music, and the arts cut. And they are tired of being inundated by new initiatives. As a board member, I will work to require new teaching positions be classroom teachers. I will vote to preserve arts and athletic programs. I will work to require that any new initiatives be backed by significant research and implemented slowly and carefully, taking into account the ongoing input of teachers and students. I will work to set a stable direction for our district, one in which the essential relationship between a student and his or her teacher is protected. Ultimately, Ultimately though, though, the direction, the direction of the school board is set by you, you the, voters. the voters. I am committed to leadership that listens to our community and to being an active working board member. I'm endorsed by the Beaverton Education Association's political committee, Senator Mark Hass, representatives Tobias Reed, Chris, Chris Harker, and Ms. Greenlick, as well as current school board members Mary Vanderweel and Sarah Smith, and the last elected school board member to Zone 7, Lisa Schultz. I hope, I hope you make, make the choice, choice of voting for first. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, now we'll have Dr. Pierce and Ms. Degman come on up and um, questions over here to my left. Please identify yourself and address your question to a particular candidate or at large, to the group at large. Thank you. We start off with Mr. Kroger. Thank you, I'm Bill Kroger, a foreign member. I'm also a Beaverton resident. Um, studies show that when parents are engaged in their children's education, they do much better. So I'm just curious, Whoever wants to respond, or all of you if you want, um, what's being done right now in the school system, if you know, and what more can be done to try to get parents more involved in their kids' education? So currently at some of the elementary schools, uh, depending upon the makeup of those schools, um, there's some amazing programs going on, in simple ones. There are dances where families can come together and ESL is being offered at these dances where p children, their families, they're in an environment that absolutely supports them. It's a once a month uh, event. And these sort of events will bring in members of the community that would not normally come in because of their long hours that they now have to work in order to um, support their families. This, this question that you brought up, Bill, is, is really near and dear to my own heart. Um, I am, I'm a doctor today, but I certainly started off in a very different place. Um, I grew up in Toronto, Canada, but my, both of my parents worked either nights or in a bakery or were a uh, teller in a bank. And they worked so hard in order to provide simple things for our family. We were never given any kind of means growing up. Um, it was school. It was school that actually provided us the, that safe haven. Um, and whenever the school put on something that would bring parents in, it absolutely motivated them to uh, be more involved to the best of their capacity. This comment is for our speakers. One minute responses. That's an excellent question. Um, I know there has been some work around this issue. Uh, Principal Debbie Nikolai at Shehalem Elementary did a wonderful job this year making sure that uh, her back to school night was 100% attended. And it obviously wasn't, but she went out into the community afterwards and knocked on the doors of the people who didn't attend. She did this twice until she reached out to the entire community. I also think we need to take a look at starting a program here in the Beaverton School District where we have classes for parents. And what I mean by that is maybe something that's offered two week, every two weeks, every month, in which we can have a class that allows parents who uh, maybe haven't gone to college or haven't gone to high school, who are wondering how to support their students academically at home to learn the skills so that they can support their students academically at home. I think they could do a lot to boost student achievement 
And with a district um, where poverty is growing and diversity is growing, I think we really need to take a look at our outreach to the community and do a little bit more. Thank you. Um, actually, we do have classes for parents. Um, we, they send out emails. If you're on the email list, you can sign up. Or they send out flyers and notices out to all the parents, whether it's learning how to um, you know, be a parent to a teenager, which we all know can be a daunting task if it's your first teenager coming up, or um, help them get them through their academic um, years and to be able to graduate. So there are a lot of resources. And when you go to the Title I schools, which are a lot of um, non-English speaking um, parents likely in, in those schools, um, they do have interpreters so that the parents feel comfortable coming in and talking. They teach, I was at a William Walker and they have um, came in and taught about health and keeping kids in school and you know taking them to doctors and when they should keep them home, when they shouldn't, what they should be feeding. So it's really kind of that whole wrap around um, teaching families how to care for their children beyond education and keeping them in school um, daily. Jim Kate, former member of special for all candidates. The majority of the school districts outside of the Eaton, so when the CEO does further renewal, tax abatements, enterprise zones, these diverting tax dollars to ensure school services. Some of those tax dollars are backed up by the state school funding program, which is the state of 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 the state I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, but there has been an issue around urban renewal in the school district. People have talked about the fact that funds that go to urban renewal have been diverted from the school district. Um, I'm concerned about that. I think that we need to wait, though, and see, because the idea is urban renewal will help grow the tax base. If it helps grow the tax base for our schools, um, and ultimately we gain more revenue, the amount of revenue we've put into urban renewal is quite small. So this could be a nice investment in the future um, so that we receive more revenue down the road. And Tom was right about that. We actually had that come up at one of our board meetings this year that, and, and we, the board, questioned why we would sign on for the urban renewal if it was going to take money directly away from our schools. Um, and the dollar amount was fairly small. I mean, it was a pretty minuscule amount. Um, but at that point, I don't think we had a choice because you sign on early and you go in as a, as a group and, and agree to that. So um, that's something we need to be watching because we don't want to take have any dollars diverted from our school district, clearly. Every dollar counts. Every dollar counts and any dollars diverted from our schools are going to increase class sizes and make learning in our schools much more difficult for our children. I understand that you know um, urban renewal is is happening. We're getting more diverse population into the area. We need to be able to set up to provide services for those those people moving in. Also, our tax structure of how we are paying for education and how the legislature is completely in charge of giving the money to our students and our school districts, that's where the change needs to happen. I'm Ted Welch, member of the forum and also resident of Beaverton. I want to thank the candidates for coming today. Excellent presentations all around and uh, should be proud of how you represent your, your cases. Um, my question is directed at the two ladies on the committee on the panel today. I, Mr. Collette, addressed several burning issues, I think, the reductions, specializations, PE, <laughs> library, and music. I wonder how our Dr. Uh, Pierce, and especially Ms. Stegman, how you would handle any kind of uh, venture to restore and or maintain the level of commitment that the school district has in music, librarianship, and PE. Thank you. So, thank you, Chad, for that question. Um, 
I actually was one of the few board members that voted against the budget this last year um, for that very reason. Uh, part of that was I think that when you take away programs like that and, and the sports piece of that as well, um, I think you are, um, it impacts the, the most high risk students that we have in our district and it does not provide the services that they may need to get to that next level in their life depending on whether that's you know college or career or, or whatever that may be you take away a sports that's only a club sport that they can't afford to do that could have been a college scholarship for them potentially um, librarians I, I was totally against cutting all the librarians out of our district I think that that's not helpful to any of our kids in the district, I asked my own kids where they learned those kind of things, and they said that they learned it from their librarians as far as research and what books to read, and, um, and those need to be brought back um, to the most we can. The levy that we have out there is for classroom teachers, and that could include librarians as well, as well as music and PE as well, so we need to be educating our children um, well-rounded and not just in specific areas, so advocating for that well-rounded child, and we'll do what I can to bring those back. I think Linda's made some really amazing points, and truthfully, uh, a well-rounded child needs PE every day, including recess. I know that my own child would not sit in his classroom whatsoever if he knew that there wasn't going to be recess. And in fact, at uh, Shehalem recently, um, they did take away recess, and they created a sign-up for a sport program. And so if you didn't like that sport, you, get, you got to sit and watch the other kids play. That's unacceptable in my book, especially for my own child. Um, art, music, um, I've had the greatest opportunity to learn languages early. I had a great opportunity to try music early. And it was these things that brought my education together for me and to lose that in, in, the, in the elementary school level, not just middle school, not just high school, not just sports for high school. A child will not know how they could excel through middle school and make it past grade eight to get through high school, uh, to, break, to make it through high school if they don't have these options early on in elementary school. So. I think we can all agree that we want um, arts classes, we want music and PE. I think how we get there matters though. Um, one of the ways we get there is through better budgeting. Um, this last budget, after speaking to many board members, they were not aware of the severity of cuts to whole child education. This year we have a budget process that only has two days for the budget committee to meet. In past years we've had four days. That time to understand the budget, to take a look at what's going on, and to fully look at what those cuts mean and how we might be able to avoid them in other ways is important. Additionally, the community last year was in support of furlough days, um, 10 furlough days. There was a survey that went out to the community. That voice was being ignored. I fear with a budget process that is shortened this year, that voice will continue to be ignored. Um, so bringing back whole child education is a very important thing that's going to require us taking a look at the budget, talking to our community, and increasing that input. Thank you. My wife's a candidate for the school board, so I'm not going to be participating in school board discussions. That'll be um, the criteria for Kathy Stanton. We are now at the end of the forum um, program, and that's my jurisdiction. Uh, basically, the P Washington County Public Affairs Forum is open to members who ask questions. We welcome anybody here. We have issues of interest um, on the day. And next week, we're doing the school board again, so that'll be Kathy's Ballywick. Um, Again, we, we're from, um, we're coming at 11.30 to one o'clock. We'll allow questions to continue because this is the public affairs forum and we'll, we'll go usually as long as anybody has a question. Um, candidates can leave, but the questions will still remain. So I'll allow our moderator to take it again. We're off TV and thank you for coming. Um, Sally Bell, forum member. A lot, a lot of the questions and concerns are related to funding and how do you see the improvement of funding? Uh, how would you see about improving in funding and how would you go about to make this happen? I don't know about what. Improvement in funding. Your, I mean, funding, funding is your main problem. So how, how are you going to address this? How are you going to make it happen?
So, yeah, that's the, that's the question of the year, isn't it? Um, you know, I think we've all talked about that. It's, it's getting down to our legislators and advocating for K through 12 funding, a higher funding level. Um, clearly, PERS reform is, is on the table, and you've been, I've been down there a couple times talking to different folks down there, senators and legislators, about um, PERS reform and where we're going with that. And working at PCC, clearly that's a concern for us as well as a higher education institution. Um, so, and, and then other revenue sources, you know, I, and I know nobody wants to hear this, everybody hates those words, sales tax, but we've got to come up with better ways of funding our education system that's more stable than, than the way we are now. And so those are, I think it's pushing the legislator and the governor to come up with better ways on um, kind of thinking outside the box. And, and again, partnerships. Partnerships are a big part of that and working with local community and businesses. I agree. I think a sales tax is important. We need to be looking at third streams of revenue, sales tax. I've heard carbon tax be batted around. But I don't think we're going to get there if it's just the board engaging with legislatures, legislators. We need to be engaging with our community as board members to build support for our schools so that there becomes a public will for things like a third stream of revenue. Um, that's a year-round process. That means that board members to need to be available to their community. They need to be talking to members. They need to be involved with political efforts, and they need to connect their constituents with concrete abilities to advocate for their children. I've attended board meetings for the past year, and I can't tell you how many times parents come up and speak, and they say, how, what can I do? I want a new sales tax. What can I do? And the answer should be, Here's a political action committee. Here's an opportunity to meet with me. Let's talk. Let's get you involved. And the answer I've been hearing is talk to your neighbors or we're doing everything we can. We've been meeting with legislators. We need an, an effort that involves the community more because this is a community issue. Our schools are community issues. And commu the funding of our schools is a community issue. And it's decided upon by community members. If we go out for a uh, sales tax, that's something that's going to have to be ratified by all the constituents in Oregon. That's going to need a, a, a wellspring of support. And uh, the way we get that wellspring of support is by opening ourselves up to the community and working with community members. Oh, I know, that would have been funny. Uh, um, I, I completely agree with my cohorts here. Um, yes. Absolutely, do we need to pass the levy? That'll get us to close to zero. But levy after levy after levy, how many can we continue to pass without having stable funding in our schools? Yes, we have to consider a, a, a different type of tax structure. But there are other ways to bring revenue into our school systems. Do you know that there are other smaller streams of, like I said, every dollar counts. And as a small business owner, I know that intimately. So every dollar counts. So did you know that in some districts here in Oregon, that if you are a speeder and you speed through a 20 mile an hour um, school zone, that if you are caught and ticketed, that a levy portion of that actual ticket goes to the school. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that every dollar counts and that ideas like that will add small but most likely fairly stable <laughs> funding to schools. Not the millions and millions of dollars we need, but every dollar will help us get closer to the interim that we have right now before we can change our tax system, before we go over these larger scale changes. John, this is a former member. Um, um, in connection with the, uh, the issue of funding and, and uh, particularly purchase reform, um, uh, I wonder where, how, as uh, potential members or actual members of the school board, um, do you feel about some of the specific proposals for purchase 
everyone wants to support a school. You feel that it's appropriate to, to, um, uh, to take money from retired feeder teachers in order to provide additional support for the current feeder budget. Um, well, let me put it that way. That's a little tough answer. <laughs> I was with you until that last sentence. Um, you know, I, I myself, I work in the public sector, so I, I'm part of PERS as, as well, not tier one, tier two. Um, so I think that, you know, there were promises made when this PERS system was set up years ago that we just cannot keep, we cannot keep meeting. I, I mean, they're, they're, we are going bankrupt trying to meet the needs of those promises that were made. Do I think we should take money away from existing retired teachers who worked their whole career selflessly? And I say selflessly because it is long hours for very little pay. Um, no, but I think that there are, is some reform that can be implemented and put forth that, um, you know, there are uh, you know, things like cost of living. You know, we're not getting cost of living. If there's no cost of living, we're not getting cost of living. So, so should people that are retired get cost of living as part of their benefits and pay if if there is, if we're in a negative, you know, recession, um, I think that we have to do something, and, and I don't know what all the answers are because it's PERS is a very complicated, um, complex issue, um, and some of it we won't know about until it goes through the court system, just because it's going to be challenged, likely, like it has in the past. Um, I think what they're looking for are those things that we think will be um, within the law or easier to get through, with, so that we're not waiting so long to see the benefit of, of those. Um, I, it's it's a tough it's a tough issue. I think that we want to make sure that our teachers have um, and all public employees that they have a retirement system that they can um, count upon. But as as a public employee, that shouldn't be the only thing that we count upon either. You know, I think it's incumbent upon us as as working people to um, invest. That's one avenue of retirement, but there should be several avenues that we should be investing our dollars in as well. But that needs to, that conversation needs to start now um, having that. So we'll see. I mean, it's a tough issue. So you'll notice that I have a paper. Uh, PERS is something that comes up a lot. I think um, it's really important when talking about PERS reform to recognize that the Beaverton School District is in a different place as compared to the rest of Oregon. Our employees make matching contributions to their retirement, easing the taxpayer's burden, and the district, anticipating increases to PERS, has wisely bonded its PERS cost, mitigating the large increases that are sweeping the state. Additionally, Beaverton has saved a lot of money by creating its own health plan, rather than opting into the more expensive Oregon plan for public employees. But what I'm worried about is that the state level, um, I support the offset part to the PERS. I think that's fair. That makes sense. If you are not within the state and you're pulling PERS and you're getting an offset for a tax that you're not paying, I think we absolutely need to eliminate that. That makes sense. I'm worried about the COLA. And the reason I'm worried is that the last time it went through the court systems, it was rejected. Now, under the governor's plan, what's going to happen is if they decide to have the COLA um, PERS if PERS reform goes out under the COLA plan, it will be considered st starting um, immediately once the legislature has enacted it. That means that it will then go to the courts, but the schools will be acting like it's gone through. If three, four, five, six years later, sometimes these things take a long time to rule on, we find out that it has been thrown out by the courts, the schools will owe a lot of money. And we're talking about money with a judicial interest on top, which can sometimes be pushing 9%. I don't want to be sitting on the school board when a wave of debt like that goes through the schools. Additionally, when we take a look at the amount of money it saves versus the risk, we're talking about $4 million under the current plan for the Beaverton School District. Now, that's significant. But when you think about the risk of incurring a large bill later and going back into the cuts that we've just got out of, I don't think it's worth it. Um, I do, however, think we need to take a look at tax breaks in this state. Um, since 2009, we've seen tax breaks increase 29%. That means in the last by enemy, there's $36 billion worth of tax cuts. Um, some of, or tax breaks, I should say. Um, some of those are great. I love the mortgage deduction. I think it helps people become homeowners. And ones that are helping generate revenue in our communities by encouraging business, I encourage those tax breaks. 
but we need to take a look at what's out there and the tax breaks that are not working for our community, are not generating more revenue, need to be stricken so we can bring money into the schools. The quality education model for our schools set funding last year at $8 billion. Last year we funded our schools actually at 5.7. That's a difference of $2.3 billion to get to a model for education that Oregonians support, okay? If we can take some of those tax breaks of the $36 billion we've seen in the last biennium and move them towards school funding, we can hit the QEM. Yes, we can't afford to continue the PERS program the way that it is. That's simply put. Uh, whether or not we want to have our children saddled with debt as a result of passing something halfway through the legislature that will later cost us as a result of a judicial penalty, do we want to have that either? No, so don't do it in the first place. Come up with a better plan. Come up with a plan that is not going to riddle these children, our children, who are going to try to go to college after this, with this kind of debt in our society today. I think that we can start, the conversation can start when we talk about teachers. So in my experience, having come from Canada, I grew up in Canada, and so as a result, I've been a part of the Canadian schooling system, which has a very different way of taking care of its teachers. Um, at the end of one year of being a teacher, you have a very rigorous uh, evaluation process. That process, and my point, I'll, I'll get to my point on that. The rigorous process um, not only tests you or ch sees how you teach, but it also sees how you feel about being a teacher and, see in, and looks at whether or not this is a long-term solu solution or job for you. Having said that, the level of teaching quality is bar none. You may have noticed that when you go to a university or a college here in the United States that your Canadian counterparts seem to be topping the list in terms of their good grades. The reasoning is really the investment in education. Number one in Canada is healthcare. Number two is education. And once you actually see a model like the Canadian schooling system that actually does invest in their teachers, keeps them accountable right out, right from the beginning, and then on top of that, pays them a equitable, uh, similar to PERS system that doesn't drain the, the entire economy for Canada, you'll notice that they did not go through this, a similar form of uh, recession as we did. Now, this is not the first time a recession has gone through. It's not the first time we've lost revenue, but do we need to saddle our children with debt? I don't think so. Thank you very much for being here. The question I have for all three candidates is um, there was a recommendation that parents get involved in some of these um, PACs or, or uh, parent groups that are working on, on funding for education. And I know there's the SMART program and there's the chalkboard program and there's the Citizens for School Support, all of these. Which ones would you each recommend for parents to get involved with? Which do you think is the most effective? Um, having been active in a number of groups myself, um, I've been working with the Beaverton Community for Education, um, which is a great group. I was down in Salem on February 18th with them talking to legislatures. They've been doing a wonderful job of getting information together and aggregating it to lots and lots of parents. I, I really recommend the work that they do. I also recommend the work of uh, Oregon Save Our Schools. And they have this great group that's forming in Beaverton called Beaverton Save Our Schools. They've been working on state funding issues at a state level. They also develop legislative concepts, um, some of which are working their way through the legislature right now, through Senator Hass and other people. And I'm, I'm very supportive of their work because I think they're taking into account like a, a broader, bigger view of the education. They talk about the OEIB, they deal with Rudy Crew, they deal with a lot of these changes to the state structure that really do affect school boards here in Beaverton 
um, but have larger ramifications. And I would recommend all three of those groups, so the Beaverton Community for Education, Beaverton Save Our Schools, and Oregon Save Our Schools. Again, I agree with Tom. Those are three great uh, community-oriented uh, factions. And I say faction because they are all fragmented. There isn't a coalescence of all parents that would come together and just work together to actually uh, lobby the legislature to talk to their neighbors and create um, that neighborhood school feeling that we've lost. Um, one of my ideas, if I was to be uh, so lucky as to be uh, the next school board member, would be to create a PTO conference for Beaverton. I would like to start there and then grow it with the help of the OEA, with the help of student government, remember them, uh, to help, with the help of the school board. And what that means is, is a, a conference where parents, the superstar parents are gonna show up. They, they will be there. But the beauty of this conference is, is that elementary can talk to middle, can talk to high school. We could break it up by zones, simply put, I would be part and part with uh, zone number seven, and as a result, those parents can talk to the middle school, and middle school will learn, will tell those elementary parents, look, this is what we're missing, in, this is where we're weak, this is where we hope you can plug and play. By doing this in that kind of way, we can grow it into a more holistic, encompassing body. And when you have that, there's more people power when you have more than just these different factions that do great things on Facebook, but when the rubber meets the road, it's still those 10 parents. So to involve entire communities of parents is really our next greatest step. And Oregon's, Oregon Save Our Schools is a great, um, great example of that. Just the name alone, Oregon. So let's do things for Oregon, and then, of course, Beaverton will grow with that as well. So I think there's a couple of things. There's the, the groups that uh, um, both Tom and, and Homa talked about. There's also Stand for Children, which went down um, on February 18th and met with them down at the legislature, and that was a, it was a great, um, interesting time down there. But Beaverton School District has a, a committee, or a, it's an organization, the um, Community Engagement Committee, that I think that's a good place to start where it brings in partnerships with, with the schools and the communities and with businesses. And a couple of our schools, elementary schools, Sexton Mountain and Shehalem, have um, partnerships with a retirement community or retirees and their neighborhood association that come in and, and they're engaged in the schools. We need that kind of grassroots level of engagement in our schools from everybody out there, not just the parents of the kids that are in school to really, I think, lift our schools up to a level that they need to be. And that, we call it our CEC, our Community Engagement Committee, which actually took the place of our local school committee. Um, but it's much bigger and broader because it's involving business and community and churches. And we have um, a faith-based conversation that we've had going on. Um, I go to Sunset Presbyterian and we go out, May 5th is our engagement day, so we will go out to multiple schools and work to help do improvements that the school district just can't afford to fund, um, whether it's doing you know, yard work um, or you know, going and painting schools or doing things like that. So it's really, I think, lifting up um, beyond just the parents of the kids in the schools. I think we need that wider community-based support. I appreciate the really good information that we've been getting this from, really good. Uh, we talked a little bit about the different groups. Um, for some, John within the uh, board member. Um, but we're talking about different groups. So we did talk pretty much seem to me like policy groups, working to, to change the policy, things like that. I wonder if I did not hear anything about it the Beavers and Education Foundation. Like this is a group of people who go out and they make a lot of money and it comes to the Beavers schools. Uh, the more the better, I'm sure. Uh, can you talk a little bit about them and how you, you think that that's a good thing for the school district? All three of them. Um, good question, and thanks for bringing that up, John. I think that they, you know, they do tremendous work, and I think that it's always a, um, a great thing when we can bring in um, those kind of dollars for our foundation for to support those students. and, and 
um, help support a lot of at-risk students with summer school programs and after-school programs to keep them engaged in school and making sure that they're staying up at the level that they need to be in their education um, and just providing those resources. You know, the other part of that is, you know, the foundation raising dollars, but also the PTOs out at all of our individual schools and elementary schools raise a great deal of money to help support their schools as well, whether it be for, you know, playground equipment or um, new computers for the classrooms um, or, you know, their computer labs. So those types of organizations coming together and raising dollars out, takes, lets us keep money within our core budget to use those dollars for classrooms and keeping teachers in our classrooms. And so it's really been put out there to these other groups, and, you know, sports groups, all of those have to go out and do their own fundraisers to help support what the school district can't. So we really put a lot of those um, dollars out to those group and have almost an expectation that they do this because we just can't fund it all anymore with the level of funding that we're getting. Yeah, I absolutely support the work of the Beaverton Education Foundation. Uh, Carol Smith, who's one of their board members, has endorsed me. I've had conversations with her about their work. I think it's excellent. I think it helps bring uh, resources into the schools in these times of need. Um, and I don't think there's much more to say. I think we all know that the schools need that extra support. PTOs provide it. I know my fiance, Jennifer, has received a lot of support um, from her PTO. She's a music teacher. Replacing instruments is a big deal. And over the years, that grants has helped keep, um, have helped keep instruments for our children. It's very important, and I support that work. Beaverton Education Foundation is just another piece in the puzzle for funding for our schools. If you want to get down to the grassroots level, you can get down to the grassroots level when you're speaking or visiting your local NAC. I'm a part of the Beaverton Central NAC, and we've put $300 together, a grant from the city, city of Beaverton, to our NAC. We've used that money together to create a summer reading program for William Walker. These are little programs that can come together and absolutely support the larger work of the Beaverton Education Foundation and create little pieces where each person in their specific environment that they enjoy going to, maybe it is uh, a church environment or it is the NAC, these are all supportive things that we can do in, 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 in accordance with the Beaverton Education Foundation. Once again, let's thank these three candidates for Zone 7 Beaverton School District Director. And um, I'm sure they'll walk slowly out the door if you want to snag them for one more question. Um, forum's closed. Well, we're done. And we'll see you all next Monday for 1, 2, 4, and 5 Zones Beaverton School District. <laughs>